predestination, but we're doing it different than anyone I have ever heard study it. Because predestination is not just about God picking his family, which he did before the world began, but predestination is more about God preordaining righteousness and godliness in our lives. And when he ordains that, he, had, he ordains all the character of Jesus in our lives. The Bible says God had a people that he foreknew. The people are the whom's he foreknew. Those are the ones he's predestined. The ones he foreknew, P-R-O-G-I-N-O-S-K-O. Now, I don't know how he knew us, but he knew us in his mind. We were not with God before the foundation of the world. The Bible doesn't teach that. People say, well, if he foreknew us, we must have been a people before the world began. No, he knew in our minds because God lives in eternity. And eternity is the forever now. Everything is now with God. He speaks of punishing Israel for a moment when he punished him for 2,600 years. He calls that a moment. He calls our life just a breath. He says we're like the grass of the field, which today is, and it's soon cut down. Uh, where our life is a vapor. It's like here, when it's brushed away, it's gone tomorrow. I know that's true. It, I thought it took... I thought I would never live to be in my 70s, and here I am. And it seemed like just the other day I was just a young man. And it's just, and it seems like such a quick movement in life. I know that very shortly I'll be out of this world. It's, that's the reality of it, and you have to live with that fact. Now, the Bible says the people that God foreknew in his mind, prognosco, comes from pro meaning before, it's our prefix pre. And gnoso, gnosko means to know intimately. Now, you can know science intimately. And a lot of people who love to play piano, you can know music intimately. And you can know mathematics in, intimately and, be, and ha, do so much of it that you, it becomes a part of you. You can have an intimate relationship with the Bible. Well, by the this says, the whom's God foreknew, masculine gender. That means this is a bunch of males or men, and women are included in that. The, the whom's that God foreknew intimately, those are the ones he's predestinated. Or pro horizo is the word. I don't believe in the word predestinate. What I believe in is the word pro horizo. Predestinate is not the word. If you look at predestinate, it means pre destiny. That means destiny it means where you're going. And pre means before. So most people look at the word predestinate. They say, oh, you believe that God knew before where you were going, so he preordained you there, and you can live the way you want to. Well, that's not what predestinate means at all. Predestinate means to predetermine for the boundary of God. And the word boundary is horizo, and there's no H's in the Greek language. There's a little what they call a dia critical mark. And the dia critical mark has a huh. Every time you find a dia critical mark, sometime it'll be on the second word the second letter of the word. It's not in this case. Horizo. So you put an H instead of the breathing sound. So horizo is our word horizon. So God has a people that he's predetermined for the light. And Jesus said, that's me. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So God has pre-Jesus those people. And that's not just predetermining where they're going. It's predetermining where they're walking. So God has preordained. If you were, if, if you were born back here, predestination... 
is a pathway to heaven. It's about a path. It's narrow. Narrow. It's full of fire, tribulation, persecution. And that's what keeps us in the narrow way. Persecution. And men will hate us for the, in God over the long period of time. We'll have to whip us and beat us to keep us in the truth because we have a tendency to want to wander out of the truth. He says, you get back here. This is your pathway. And he says, they that endure to the end shall be saved. What endure is hupo meno. It means to continue. It means to continue or to faithfully continue. And God says, I'll make sure that you continue because Philippians 1 and 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun this good work in you will perform it all the way until the day of Jesus Christ. And I have people a lot of times call me and say, I've had several people recently call me and say, How do you know that you're predestined? How do you know you're a believer? Well, a believer is obedient to God's word. Faith and believe are the same word in one sense. In the Greek language you have, here's how you know you believe. Believing is doing truth. You're going to have a hunger. You're going to have a hunger for the word of God. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. What is it that makes you hungry? Huh? Why do you get hungry? You get empty, don't you? And you have to be emptied of self before you hunger for righteousness. But you can't empty yourself because there's none that seeks after God. So God has to empty us. Remember when he would say, Blessed are the poor in spirit. And he said the and Jesus said in Luke four eighteen, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the same word as poor in spirit there in Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven was a term for Israel, and that's the church. Poor is the word P-T-O-C-H-O-S. Tokas, it means emptied out. So when you get emptied of self through all this fire and this trial, then what God is doing, he's making you hungry for the truth. And that's what believe is. Believe is the word P-I-S-T-E-U-O. Faith is the word P-I-S-T. Notice the stem of the word uh, I-S. Only the word ending is changed depending on some character of the word. Believe is the verb. Faith is the noun form of the same word. So if faith cometh by hearing... And hear and obey the same word, then believing is hearing or obeying. So when you have this desire to obey God and you want to increase that obedience to God, become more and more desirous of His word over the years, and you want to study the word and you want to learn the truth, when you learn, you take your cross and die daily, don't you? Jesus said, if a man does not, he said, if you don't bear your cross, you can't be my disciple and you can't be a learner. A disciple is the word learner. It's the word mathetes. And he says, and faith is substance, hypostasis, it's understanding. And when you understand, you learn. And that's by a cross. So that's what faith is. So faith is a daily cross. Here's how you know that your believer, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't mean mentally assent that he lived. It's talking about if you believe God, you're going to get you a Bible and you're going to struggle with it the first 10 or 15 years. And you'll say, boy, I just can't get a hold of a lot of this. That's my whole purpose of preaching here. That's why I'll repeat these things over and over I want you to understand, I'm trying to help you to understand how you know you're a believer. You don't, people say, how do you know you're saved? Well, I remember the night I got saved. There's no such thing as got saved. 
You don't get saved like you get bread at the grocery store or, or some bologna. I went to the store and got some bread and I got some bologna and I got some saved. It's in a package about this big. It says saved on it. Well, you don't go and get saved. There's no such thing as get saved. Saved is that pathway. He that hath begun the good work will perform it all the way to the day of Jesus Christ. We have been saved. We're being saved. And we shall be saved because we're hungering after righteousness and because God has emptied us with all of these fire and trials. When you start off life, you don't have a lot of belief. You have a little bit of belief. I have so many people come to me and say, but I just don't want to study all the time. Neither do I. I have those ups and downs. I'll go up, down, up, down. Sometimes I'll get up and study for a good while, and then I'll get down for a good while and get back up. I have that same thing going on in my life. You think that's not difficult for everybody? Does anybody have that problem? Does anybody want to lie about it? Everybody has that problem. What I want to tell you is what is common to you is common to me. Well, yeah, but you always know the Bible. I have not. When I was 16 or 17, I started reading the Bible. had no idea where I was going. I'd read a while and I'd quit. And I'd say, I will never get this. And I'd read some more and I'd quit. Except back then it was like this. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't keep going to save my life. And then the more I learned, I'd stay up here a while, then I'd fall, get back up. The more I learned, the longer I'd go. Well, I still have a hard time. I go up and down, doesn't everybody? So when you do, don't think you're going to learn this quick. So neither is believing God quick. It takes a long time for God to empty you to make you hungry. When he says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness tomorrow. <laughs> no, he didn't say tomorrow, did he? No. It's, it comes over time. And that's what saved is about. It's what God's predestined us to. He only predestined his family, his wife, the church. He doesn't love everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and died for her. Now, we're predestined to conform to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 8 and 29. And this is what we're talking about. I believe Sunday night teachings that I'm teaching right now, it may not be as exciting as the 70 weeks of Daniel that I'm teaching on Sunday morning, but I believe, I believe it has a more clear application to the believer's life. If you watch these Sunday night messages it's more applicable to our lives. I'll go ahead and say it, even in the 70 weeks. 70 weeks is exciting because it's all about prophecy and bombs blowing up and the world beast coming on the scene and here's Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and, and then you got the world rising up and you got all this turmoil going on. Hey, boy, that's exciting. Let's go ride down the road and chase that ambulance and see how many people got killed in that car wreck. Hey, let's watch a horror movie. People... That's why people like the prophecy. What I'm preaching on a Sunday night is what we're predestined to, to be conformed. Whom he did for, no, he also did predestinate. To be conformed to the image, the icon, the likeness of Jesus. What was Jesus like? We've been talking about what was Jesus like? And what he was not like. And I'm emphasizing what he was not like right now. I've been teaching on a word that I really like. It has really hit me because I've had a lot of this go on in the church. And the word I'm talking about is the Greek word eruthia. Eruthia. Now, I'm going to talk about that some more because we have by no means exhausted it. Erethea is a common word that means strife, strife. Let me write this word down. Erethea. And the word that comes from Erethea is the word eris. 
in eris means means contention. And when the Bible's talking about this or strife, it's not talking about means to wrestle. A wrestling or strife, but I like the word Eruthia, and I'm going to put it on the board again. This word Eruthia, a common word that the Bible says, and Jesus was not, he was not carnal. And the Bible says when you are carnal, when you are sarkikos, when you're sarkikos, it comes from the word sarks, Sarks is the word flesh. When you're living fleshly, you are sarkikos, you're living carnal. Now the scripture tells us that the man who is living carnal is involved in eruthia. Now this will really, and this you may think you're spiritual, but when you get into eruthia, it's a very convicting word. Look back over here, we've been using this verse over here in I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to keep on this word until I exhaust it. This is one of my favorite words because it's something that goes on in the church all the time. It went on the ch- with the church at Corinth, it went on the church at Rome, it went on in the church at Galatia and Ephesus and Philippi and Colossia. It went on in all the churches of the Bible. When you see the seven churches of Asia starting in the second chapter of Revelation, each one of those churches had some major problems and God is having John direct his words to these churches over here in what we would call Western Turkey, but it was called Asia Minor back then. The seven churches of, of the seven churches were over here in Western Turkey, Asia Minor. Now, I want us to look over here again to first, this is what Jesus was not like. This is a favorite verse because I've had this go on a lot in this church. Jesus was not carnal. When Paul is writing to Corinth, the Corinthian church, when they started all, they were living like the world. Now, why wouldn't they live like the world? Corinth is over here you see, here's Greece. Let me see if I can draw a little picture of Greece. All right, here. It won't be just right. Looks like a hand coming down here. Two, three. Looks like a thumb down there. And then it goes up here to Greece. Well, This down here was called the Peloponnesus. I think it's one L. Peloponnesus. That's what this down here was called. This was upper Greece up here. And up here they called... They called... I'll put that on the board again. Erythea. And up here they call Macedon. And you had this, uh, you had the Aegean Sea right here. So when you go up here, this is the Aegean Sea. And right down here, this is a land bridge. This is all Mediterranean Sea here. Comes into a bay right here and Mediterranean Sea over here. And Corinth <coughs> was right here, right there on the, <coughs> just on that land bridge, just as you reach the Peloponnesus. Now they say these waters down here were so treacherous that the sailors would not want to run those waters, so they would come in to this bay right here, and they would, a lot of times, unload their ships and put them on another ship over here. Over here. The little sailboat there. 
and they'd put it on a ship there and then go off where they needed to go. At one time, they even considered putting a canal in there so they could go right straight through, but they never accomplished that. Well, Corinth was right here in the center of Greece, and they had all kinds of temples around them. They had the Temple of Persephone and the Temple of Aphrodite and the temples of of uh, uh, Zeus and temples to all these gods. And they had in these temples around Greece, they had sexual promiscuity, the sex on the altars, offering animal sacrifices, something all, some of them offering children sacrifices. Corinth was one of the most corrupt cities in the ancient world. It was just corrupt to the core. And they had all kinds of sailors, and they had all these people speaking all of these dialects or dialectos, dialectos. And they had them speaking all these gloss of foreign languages. And it was that's why Paul had so much to say about speaking in glossa or speaking in foreign languages there in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. So he's corrected them. They had all kinds of corruption all around the church, and Paul founded a church there. So when he's having these problems with Corinth, that's because they have every kind of outside influence coming into the church there. People come in and say, hey, I think I got a word to say. And Paul, Paul said, tell the person to sit down. Now, here in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, Paul is telling them how carnal they are. They probably got a lot of influence of people from Corinth coming in there with all kinds of words to say. He tells them, don't speak up unless you have an interpreter there, somebody that can interpret these different gloss and dialects, because you got sailors, you got Corinthians. Corinth was like a hub of world trade. All the ships come through there. It was a hub. That's what it was. They had every kind of personality, every kind of language that was going on in the world. Sailors, they had prostitution, every kind of worldly thing you could think of was at Corinth. So it's no wonder they were weak like this. And Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unspiritual. I want to talk to you like you're spiritual people, but you're not. The word spiritual, pneumaticos, P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-C-K-O-S. Pneumaticos comes from P-N-E-U-M-A, which is the word spirit. And spiritual, pneumaticos, means non-carnal. He says, I want to talk to you as though you weren't carnal, but you are. I've heard preachers say, well, we don't believe that there's any such thing as a carnal Christian. Tell Paul that right here. He says, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Your babies, I have to feed you with milk. You're just like the people over there in Hebrews 5. You need to be eating meat, but you actually need somebody to teach you again because you haven't gone on to the, you haven't left the principles of the doctrines of faith and moved on unto perfection. Perfection is the word teleates. It means maturity. You haven't matured and grown up. And you have to mature and become an adult, spirit, an, a, a spiritual adult. You have to be a, a man or a grown woman. You can't just stay a child. And he says, here's what happens when you get involved. And Now, don't think that everybody that has come to Grace and Truth Ministries for long periods of time is spiritual. Everybody grows at a different growth rate. Everybody doesn't have the same amount of faith. Paul said, I've, he said, God has given us measure of faith, but everybody doesn't have the same measure. If faith is dying, then everybody don't have the same amount of dying. Now he says, I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear the meat, neither yet are you now, neither yet are you now, are you now able. For ye are yet carnal, your fleshly, and he tells you how you can tell somebody's fleshly. 
For whereas there is among you envying, envy is the word zealous, it means hated or warm. You have hated feelings toward each other because, because you've got people in here that want to lead in the church. Uh, we, wanna, we don't want to follow uh, your leader. I want to follow my leader. Sometimes people's leader is themselves. And that's actually always what it is whenever they want to start setting up factions in the church. And he says, For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envyings, so whenever people are envying, they are carnal, aren't they? The common word is zealous, and I'm going to get into this more. It's zealous. It means to be heated up and angry. It means to let your orge get involved. Orge is the wrath of covetousness. It's whenever somebody takes your attention. I think I deserve more attention. I think I deserve more position. I think I should be where the preacher is because I'm smart as he is. Well, maybe you are, but you're not as old and you hadn't been where I've been. So you're not going to be in charge until God takes you to a ministry somewhere else. I've had that go on so many times. Now, so you're, you're zealous. You're all heated up because somebody's getting attention you think belongs to you. And the next word is the word I've been spending some time on. Your envying and strife, Eruthia. That's the word I've been really zeroing in on because I want to give you all the times this word is mentioned in the Bible. This word, Eruthia, goes on in churches all the time. It's gone on recently here. It's gone on for years here. This word, Eruthia, he says there's strife in the church. Now, what did he say they were? They're carnal. They're fleshly. When you're carnal, you're sarkikos. One of the things you are, you're erythea. You're involved in strife. Now, that word erythea is a very interesting word. It, uh, well, I dropped my paper. It's a very interesting word. It means intrigue. Now, when you look up intrigue in your dictionary, it means an intricate plot. It means to scheme secretly. Oh, I've had this happen a bunch of times. I had had somebody come to me and said, this other church... Uh, somebody came to me and wanted me to spy on you, Jim Brown. Now, I don't know what we're doing here that you want to spy. We're not building any nuclear warheads. We don't have machine guns here. We don't have a, a supply of arms. Uh, we don't have, we're not selling drugs. We don't grow pot. We, if you come to me and say, can you tell me what's going on? I'll say, yeah, I'll tell you all of our secrets. Huh? What secrets? What secrets? Yeah, what secrets? I'll tell you all the secrets that we don't have that we say out loud here. Do you know more than once we've had people people try to employ, some, employ somebody as a spy? I've had this been going on for 16, 18 years. Oh, so-and-so over here said they were sent over here to spy on you. Why? What's going on over there? Well, the same thing we've all always had going on. It means to intricately plot. I've had people plotting against me. Let's get together and let's figure out a way to destroy Jim Brown. And I had one guy left here back in 93. And uh, he said I was, back in 1993, whenever, that's a long time ago. And uh, he said, I'm going to destroy your ministry. He was here for several years. 
pretended to be one of my best friends. He said, you destroyed my family, and I'm going to destroy you. He said, you destroyed my family because you told me to separate from my family. And uh, I separated from my daughter at her wedding, and I wouldn't go to her wedding because they, had, uh, they were serving champagne there, and I separated, and you've destroyed my family. Well, you weren't supposed to go there if you're living right. What's funny, I went by his house one night, went by his house one day, and being an old country guy from the country and a simple man, I just was in his kitchen standing there, and I pulled over his refrigerator and said, what do you got to eat in here? And there was a shelf full of Budweiser on one of the shelves. He said, uh, I'm, uh, I'm keeping that for uh, some people. I, uh, uh, you're keeping beer for some people? Even if you're not drinking it, you're not supposed to be keeping it, but do I believe he's keeping it for somebody? Yeah, himself. And then another night I was over, he said, uh, now this is the guy that I ruined his family because and he was gossiping around trying to tear the ministry apart because I ruined his family. I told him to separate from people who walk disorderly and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather rebuke them. And one night I was over there, and he wanted to play this tape for me. And he said, let me show you something over here. And he went to the closet, opened the closet door, and there was a liquor cabinet up there, all kinds of wine and liquor and hard liquor up there. And I, he said, oh, I, I, I meant to throw that away, and I just haven't taken time. I should have said, how about right now? Let's go over here and empty that out. I should have done it. You see, this kind of erutheia has been going on a long time with me. I've had people recently doing that. I had people two years ago doing that. I had people 10 years ago doing this. I've had people 15 years ago doing this. I can sit here and tell you stories night after night after night. Go all day long with you. This thing of plotting against Jim Brown. We're going to get him. Scheming secretly or underhanded. Lee. underhandedly to trick or to perplex. Now when somebody, perplex means to puzzle. It's a conundrum. It's a, it's a puzzling to you. It's a riddle. You can't figure out what are their actions? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? I've asked myself that many times. I used to ask Mike, 15 years ago, I'd say, Mike, a lot of people come in the church and just start fights with me and start trouble. He used one word, he said, envy. They're envious of anyone who stands up and is in power. And I've learned that that's true. I'm not trying to be in power. I just happen to be the pastor of this ministry because we started in a Bible study in my home with four people. And we ended up with three the following week. So that's... And we're not going to turn it over to you because you think I'm smarter as Jim. Well, you can't have it. You need to go out and do your own thing. Now, it means to do things underhandedly, to trick people. People use all kinds of ways to trick people and try to get you to do things and say things that you wouldn't do. It's a tricky way of living. It means to plot now, when you plot, you get together over to the side, and it means a faction. A faction is a clique. Now, people will say, there's a clique over there, and I'm not in the clique. The reason you're not in the clique is because you don't volunteer to come up and say, here I am, uh, what can I do? Instead, you sit off here over here by yourself and say, I'm not in the clique and I, I'm, I think I deserve more attention and people need to pay attention to me. It means a faction, and a faction is... I love this definition. A faction is a group of people, a group of people working in a common cause against 
the main body. They're working at a common cause against the church to bring the preacher down, to bring the church down. You can't. If it's of God, like Gamaliel said, you can't stop it. And if it's not of God, it won't continue. We've been continuing for 26 years and you're wasting your time trying to destroy it. Now that's this word. I love this word. You know why I like this so much? This goes on in every church over and over and over again. It's strife. It's contention. It is... I want to look at some of these words. And he says here, for your carnal, there's among you a bunch of angry, heated, envying, and you're plotting. See, all it says here is your envying and strife and divisions. And that doesn't sound too serious until you define these words. Division means it's dicostasia, D I C H O. Dicostasia comes from dico which is the word two, or two, stasis, two standings. You have two standings in the church when you have people that are a group plotting against the main body. They're involved in intrigue, in an intricate plot to bring down the preacher, or bring down somebody in the church, or destroy families, or destroy lives. If you do that, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know what you are if you're doing that? I don't care how spiritual you look. You're carnal. You're fleshly. Nobody in the church has any business being erithia. Eris means just to wrestle and wrangle and fight for no reason. And that's what people do. You know why they do it? To get attention. I think I deserve more attention than I'm getting it's called pride. They want to shine above others. And the Bible says, God resists the proud. Resist. Antitasomai means to wage war against the proud. Huperephanos, H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. That's the word proud. God resists the proud. Come from Hooper above. Above and phanos, meaning to shine. People are wanting to shine above others. They're wanting preeminence in the church. That's the same thing that Amanda Atrophies wanted when when John wrote his third look over there in the third in the third in third John. In John is writing to the church in 3 John <clears throat> he's writing unto the elder the well beloved Gaius whom I love in the truth and he says beloved I wish above all things thou mayest prosper you a dao well way be in the well way and be in health even as thy soul prospers health hugiano means same thing as wholesome words or sound doctrine, uncorrupt words. I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified, martyreo, M-A-T-U-R-E-O. It comes from the word martyr. And when you testify, you martyr yourself, you lay your life down. When they testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. If they're walking in the truth, what is it they're walking in? He says there in verse 1, I lo- he says, Beloved guys whom I love, agape in the truth. Well, agape is walking in God's commandments, and that's walking in the truth. Agape is walking in truth. Now, let's read on here. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Notice that he says that in verse 3, says it in verse 4, and when he says prosper, you hodos, that is the well way. And the way is narrow. Jesus said narrow is the way that leads to life. There's also a broad way. So the well way 
is the narrow way, and that's walking in truth because he, he prefaces it in the verse before and the verse after. So he's talking about the well way, it's narrow, and there's a broad way. So the well way, he defines it right here, is walking in truth, isn't it? He says, my beloved guys, whom I agape in the truth, in 2 John 6 says, this is agape, that we walk after his commandments. Then he says down here in verse 3, even as thou walkest in truth, at the end of verse 3, and he said, I, re I have great joy to hear that my children walk in truth. He says that twice. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to the strangers, which have borne witness of the agape, charity. Be charity. Huh? Charity. What? Oh. Before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them received us not. Diotrephes was a man in the church. He liked to have preeminence. Philo protuo. P H I L. Protuo. Now, see, the word philos means to have an affection. Remember, philos is a word that means affection. And we get the word proton from that. A proton is in the center of the action, and it was supposed to be first in the structure of all things. In the structure, in protuo means first. It means the atrophies wanted to be first in the church. I want people to look at me, and I want people to give me more attention than I deserve who loveth to have preeminence among them, and whoever wants to have preeminence does not receive the pastor or the leaders of the church. He did not receive us. Wherefore, if I come to you, Gaius, I'll remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us, fluareo, P-H-E, L-U-A-R-E-O, P-H-L-A-U-R-E-O, furao, prating, babbling and trifling and berating us idly and mischievously. That's what this means. To berate, to babble and trifle. Whoever wants the preeminence in the church is a babbling trifler, Trifle means I don't want to work. I don't want to be, say he is trifling. That means he's lazy. Against us with malicious words, poneros, P-O-N-E-R-O-S. Anybody who wants preeminence is poneros. It means to hurt are to be hurtful and be evil. People who want to be chief and be seen and heard, they're poneros, and they're prating and rattling and trifling, and they don't want to work in accord with the church because they're plotting against the main body. They are erethea. They're involved in strife and intricate plot and scheme to destroy the preacher and the church because they think they deserve attention. Prating against us with malicious words, that's the word malicious, and not content therewith. They're not archaeo. A-R-K-E-O is the word content. They do not have enough attention 
enough recognition, enough authority. I think it's time for me to be the leader in the church. You know what you do to lead? First of all, you learn to follow. And when you lead, you do like the first sergeant does in the army. He didn't say, okay, man, get out there and get him. The first sergeant jumped over the, he jumps out of the foxhole and says, men, follow me. And he heads towards the enemy. When you lead, you put yourself in the line of fire. That's what you do. And you don't have to be told to lead. You look for something to do. If it's sweep the floor, if it's clean the bathrooms, if it's carry out the trash, you look for anything to do. That's what, that's what forms a real leader. A leader has to be an excellent follower. You have to, and sometimes you have to follow a year, two years, five years, ten years. I was 49 before this ministry started. And it didn't start as a ministry. It started as a Bible class in my church. I never tried to build anything, ever. I'm at home, excuse me. It started as a Bible class in my home, and we never tried to build anything. One guy comes, says, can I film it? I said, yeah. He says, I'll put it on TV. I said, what kind of TV? He said, public access. I said, I'm not even familiar with that. So he filmed it, started putting us on TV, and that was back in the early 90s, and now here we are. On 200 towns and cities, I never tried to build anything. What you do is you learn and you do what you can, but you don't do anything to tear people down. You're not going anywhere when you do that. You're carnal, you're a child. And you don't have any business teaching anybody anything. They're malicious, they're not content. They don't have enough. Remember, content... Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content over there in Philippians, the fourth chapter. That word content means to ward away or push away self. It's word autarcheo. It's part of this word archaeo, A-U-T-A-R-K-E-O. Archaeo means to push away autos, self. To push self away, that's when you learn contentment. But when self is seeking the preeminence like Diotrephes here, you're not going anywhere. You know, God has to humble you and crush you and put you on your face before you can do any good in the work of God. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. I love this next sentence. He that doeth good, agatha poeo is the word doeth good, A-G-A-T-H-A-P-O-I-E-O. -E you notice some words there. Poeo is the word do or make, but it means to make some kind of tapestry, some kind of decorative thing. This word poeo is not the common word ergon, which means to toil or labor. This is the same word. We are his workmanship, P-O-I-E-M-A, it comes from the word poeo, meaning to make or do. It means we are his tapestry. Tapestry, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And agathos is the word beneficial. So when it speaks of agathos poeo, it's talking about beneficial work of God that's in us. So he says, these, he that doeth good. When you do good, you're a beneficial work of God, is of God. But he that doeth evil, kakapaeo, k-a-k-o, p-o-i-e-o. Poeo, that word do, it means Evil doing. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. God has to be convicting your heart about the evil that's going on in your life. If you have no conviction, the Bible says you are doing evil. Do I believe a believer can do evil 
and lie and steal and cheat and be a believer. I believe he's going to have conviction. He's going to know or she's going to know that they're not doing right if they're a believer. If they're not a believer, they may have convinced themselves that they're okay with God. They may have memorized words. They may be able to get them to come out of their mouth from their head, but it hadn't gotten in their heart. How do you know when it's in their heart? They're going to really care about people. They're going to have compassion. They're going to be gentle. They're going to be tenderhearted. They're going to look at people and say, man, I, I feel so bad for that lady or that man. They're hurting so bad, and I care about them, and I'd like to help them. In fact, you'll even feel bad about people that are out there having a hard time in the world, and they're not even believers. There has to be a compassion in a person's mind and heart to be a true believer. You have to have that. Now, I wish you'd read this commentary about that guy in my Bible. It's really good. About what? That Diotrephes. Diotrephes? Yeah, the guy wrote it. Huh? Matthew Henry wrote it. I'm Matthew Henry will give it to me and I'll read it. Nine. Mary wants me to read it. I don't mind reading that. Diotrephes. I'll take my wife's Bible. Here is a very different example in character, an office, an officer, a minister in the church. He's one of the preachers in the church that wants preeminence. Less generous, Catholic, it's not talking about Roman Catholic, it's talking about universal, and communicative than the private Christians. His name was a Gentile name, Diotrephus. He attended with an unchristian spirit. He went to church without a Christian spirit. He was a leader in the church, an officer in the church. His temper and spirit were full of pride and ambition. I want to climb the ladder and be somebody. He loved to have preeminence. It is an ill, unbecoming character of Christ's ministers to love preeminence. Now, a lot of, I've been accused of that. You know what I really want to do sometimes? I want to go west, get in my car and go west as far as I can, go find me a cave out there in Carlsbad, New Mexico, in Carlsbad Cavern, and go crawl in that hole and stay there for the next 50 years. I just want to hide from the world sometimes. I can't leave for in the morning. Huh? I can't leave for in the morning, Mary said. <laughs> he had contempt for the apostles, authority, letter, and friends. He had contempt for the apostles. Some people have come here and had contempt for me. Not one person, not two people. You think that's worth many, reading? many, many of them. Now, huh? huh? You think that's worth reading? You think what? You think that was worth reading? Yeah, it is worth reading. That was good, yeah. So he had contempt for the church, heads of the church. And he came as an officer in the church. It's time for me to shine above everybody else. If that's going on in your life, pride goeth before a fall, and you will go crashing headlong into the ground one day. Now, well, let's go ahead and read the rest. It's beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. I love this. I love that. that, that. But he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, martyreo, or martyria, which is also the same word as martyr. And ye know that our record is true. Martyria is the word record. It comes from martyr. or the, It's the same word as testimony. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Be to, peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. And he says, when I get there, I'm going to remember Diotrephes and his arrogance in the church. Now, let's get back to this word Erythea. I want us to look at a couple of places where we have this. Over here in Second Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12. I read this last week. I love this word. I don't feel like I'm fully covering it. 
It's people who try to destroy the church. They try to get in the church. Sometimes me and Mary talk, and I can't tell you what people fighting the church does to us. And she'll say, I'm so tired of this. I can't handle this stuff that's going on. It makes my blood pressure go up. Let me tell you something. You're not just fooling with me. You're fooling with my wife. When any church people come along and they cause my wife's blood pressure to go up, if she has a stroke because of it, I'm going to hold you responsible. If you think I can forgive that real easy, if she had a stroke or she had a heart attack because of this, you're on my bad side. Now, you can do to me what you want. When you mess with the church, mess with my family, mess with my wife, and give me a hard time that stresses her out, and this stresses her out, you're becoming my worst enemy. I, I'm just going to say that. I've had people that put Mary under stress, and people have said, well, she don't need to be stressed out. That's my wife. She and I are one. Like the old saying goes, we're joined at the hip. You mess with her, you mess with me. You mess with me, you mess with her. Now, take that. Right? <laughs> now, remember that definition. Everything is strife, intrigue, intricate plotting behind the scenes to scheme, to secretly and be underhanded, to trick or perplex, to plot. A group of people working in common cause against the church, the main body in the church. I get tired of this. I'm too old to fight. What, let me, I just got one thing to say. Go away. Okay? How's that? Now. Now look here in, where did I say he was going? 2 Corinthians 12. I'm going to stay on this till we exhaust this subject. Now, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. Paul has jumped the case of the Corinthians just over and over. He's told them, your faith has to increase. When your faith increases, we had one guy come in here. He said, your faith didn't have to increase. We looked like a guy anyway. Uh, said, your faith didn't have to increase. And Paul says, in, in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, he said, I was a real evil man for saying your faith had to increase. And this guy was also plotting against the church and still plots. Guy, remember I said that. Still plots against the church, working in a common cause against Jim Brown and the church. We've had this with a bunch of people. We've had a couple of cases this past year that were real serious. And I, and I know this is going to happen over and over. But when it happens, from now on I'm going to say, why don't you go away somewhere? Just get out of my life. I don't have time for this foolishness. I'm trying to teach truth. And here this fellow said, uh, faith doesn't have to increase. And Paul says here, uh, in verse 15 of chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, not boasting of things without measure or outside the measure of God, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you. Enlarged means to be lifted up. Paul was being put down the by the Corinthian church because there were people in there working in a common cause against the main body and against Paul. He said, we don't like you when you come here. He said, wait till I... We don't like your letters. In fact, in this same chapter, back up to... Back up to verse 8. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us, 
for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. I'm not trying to destroy you with my instructions, even though I'm having to correct Corinth real severely, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. You see, they thought his letters were so terrifying because he was always correcting them hard. He said, you got a man over there that's having an affair with his stepmother. Get rid of that man in the church. So that when God deals with him, he'll hear. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful. You think my letters are weighty? Wait till I get there to Corinth. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. This is what they were saying about Paul. I'm not the only guy that has these problems. Now, he says there in verse, well, as I said in verse 20 of chapter 12, For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I want to find you. Corinth had problems. Grace and Truth Ministries, any church that preaches truth like we preach is going to have problems. You can go to one of these big fancy churches where they preach a mush gospel when somebody's having an affair or baby's out of wedlock, the preachers go up and say, there, there, God will bless you and everything's going to be okay. And he, You don't rebuke them outright. You say, look, you can't live this way. When somebody's sleeping around, you tell them you can't come here and live like this. And I've done that with some people here. I'm never real hard on people. I just talk to them gently and kindly. I say, you know where where you're living is wrong, don't you? Yeah, I've even had them break down crying. I had one guy sit in my kitchen and break down and start boohooing. So you can't live this way. I know I can. I'm really going to repent and I'm going to change my ways. He got up and went out and took off again on his same, same track. It's not that I think I'm better. It's just that if you're going to be a pastor, you better do better than letting people get by with these things. When you go to some big, fancy, mushy church, they just pat everybody on the head and say, there, there, everything's going to be okay. And you can't do that. He says, I shall not find you such as I want to find you, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. I'm going to be found of you when I get there, And you're not going to like what I'm like when I get there because I'm going to call you to account. Such as you would not means you don't want to find me this way, but I'm going to be hard on you. Why was he saying this? Because Corinth was an apostate church. Lest there be debates, heiress, wrestling, and fighting. There be debates... And envyings, zealous, you, here you are fighting each other, fighting over what, who's head of this and who's head of that and who gets to get the attention. I wish sometimes I wouldn't get this much attention. Envyings, wraths, there's that word. No, strifes. Wraths is the word thumos. You're breathing hard. You're... Ha, 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 and we don't like that, and you're doing evil, and you're zealous, and you're, you're all hot and bothered at each other, and, and you're involved in your orgay, and we're going to have our way, and we'll get you back, and I'll get my revenge. That's not Christianity. Some people have really, you know, they can hear a message like this, and it's no more convicting than if you pour a glass of water on the ground. They can hear you say these things, and they will not change. You know why? Their hearts are hardened. Parao. You're saying it. Huh? You're saying it. Yeah, when if somebody has something against me, we don't like the man that's saying it, so we're not going to listen to the Word of God while he's saying it. Well, that's going to be your problem with God when he deals with you. Yeah. All right. And this applies to so many people that have been here. Maybe some people that left 10 years ago, 12 years ago are watching. When you fought me leaving, it's the wrong thing to do. Be like Bob Stanley. Bob Stanley shows up about once every three years. He'll call me and say, can I come back? I said, well, yeah, come on. He'll come in and sit down. 
stay here for about three months and he's gone again. Go to Florida, go to Oklahoma or something. And he calls and says, can I come back? One thing Bob don't do, he don't burn his bridges when he leaves. He needs to come back and redo the yeah, yeah, Bob, we need you wherever you are. He's the one that put our letters up here. Bob Stanley, where are you when we need you? <laughs> he put our letters up here. So, Bobby, if you're watching, come back to Nashville and put us some more letters on the board, okay? That's the best way to leave is leave without burning the bridges. You might want to go back over. Most people that have burned the bridges cannot come here. With all the gossip they've done, and they're going to have to stand up here. This is the price. You've got to stand up here in front of the camera and say, I've been foolish, I've lied about Jim, I've lied about the church, I've done this, and your heart has to be broken in order to come back here. Most people are not, and the reason I will have them stand in front of the camera because a lot of them send letters and emails to people around the country, and Jim Brown is this and Jim Brown is that. You can't come back here without standing in front of the camera and telling people what a fool you've been so at least the people that see you out there that you've sent these emails and letters to that they'll know. Now, that's the price you paid. You burned your bridges. Not one or two people. Bunches of them. Some people that left years ago. You say, but these, those people weren't as close to you as people that have left here in the last year. Yes, they were. They were just as close as anybody that's ever been here. I've had people leave here 10, 15 years ago that were close to me as a brother. And they just get mad and they want attention and they leave. Now, do you know how you really get attention? You volunteer to do everything you can. And that's not just here. That's if you're in the Army. If you work in insurance. If you work in real estate. The person that stays busy all the time is the one that's promoted. And they don't look for attention and they don't want to have preeminence. Yeah, Rusty. Good term is approbation lust. Huh? I said a good term is approbation lust. They want the attention of man. I couldn't hear you. I said the term approbation. Approbation, yeah. They want the attention of man. That's what it is. Yeah. They want to be they want to have attention. And that's happened with Rusty in martial arts. He's had people come in and want to show him what martial arts is about haven't they and rusty was a world champion and showing him what martial arts is about it's like me going out here on a job and showing a carpenter how to build a house and i don't know nothing about it i mean you don't show rusty how to do martial arts how crazy and you have young guys come along all the time want to tell the leader here's how you lead Okay, thank you very much. I didn't learn anything in 75 years. Now, where was I? When your faith is increased. All right, he says here no, uh, in verse 20, debates, wraths, strifes. Strife is the word erutheia. He said, I got that going on in the church over here at Corinth. I got people in a common cause trying to destroy the main body. They're trying to destroy me because they say my, my letters are weighty and they don't like the way I talk to them in a letter. Wait till I get there, Paul said. And you'll run me out of town on the rail probably. Strifes, backbiters. Katalalia, K-A-T-A-L-A-L-I-A. It means to talk against. I got people even right now talking against me to people in the church. You should be ashamed of yourself. I'm trying to teach truth, and I got people trying to stop me while I'm trying to tell the truth. All right. Debates, backbiters, whisperings, the Thurismos, P-S-I, T-H-U-R, P-S-I, Thurismos, P 
P.S. We probably get the word from that. Psst, let me tell you something. Psturismas. And it means slander or secret distraction. Doing something in secret, in secret up here, to distract people from the truth and from the church here at Corinth. I've got so much to say on this. I'm going to keep going on this. He says, swellings, phusiasis, P-H-U-S-I-O, P-H-U-S-I-O-S-I-S. Remember the word phusiao? It means to be inflated, haughtiness, and the word phusiao, P-H-U-S-I-O-O, means to inflate oneself. A lot of people think of themselves very highly more than they ought to. The older you get and the longer you live, and I've been accused of being, <clears throat> I've had people say, Jim Brown, knowledge puffs you up. You've got a lot of knowledge. So everybody that has knowledge is puffed up and big-headed. No. <laughs> knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Knowledge, if all you have is knowledge and you don't really ever walk in God's commandments, charity is the word agape and that's what edifies the body of Christ. Edify, O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E-O. -O -O. Oikodomeo domeo comes from oikos and dome. Dome is the word dome or our word roof. When they finished the roof of an oikos, a house, they said the house was built. Well, agape, charity, walking in God's commandments, is what builds the house of God. But to have charity, you've got to know and do. Just knowing is not enough. The more you know, the longer you live, the more you know. Now, it may look at... You know why people say Jim Brown is, uh, he's got too much knowledge. S sounds like a Mennonite. A Mennonite's only if they let their kids go to the 8th grade. They don't have a ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. They don't graduate from high school. They see the reason they let them go to the 8th grade is because they don't want them to get any more knowledge than that because that'll mess their minds up. I don't think so. The, the more knowledge you get, if you can study for 75 or 80 years, what God does, the more you learn, the more humble He does to you. But the more you learn, the more bold you become to men. The more bold you are to men and the more humble you are to God. Humble to God. To God. Now, you can't be humble to God and man at the same time. When you're humble to God, you'll be bold to man. And when you're humble to men, humble to men, you'll be bold toward God instead of humbling yourself. So the older and the longer you live, and the reason will people will say, Jim Brown, you're, you're, uh, you're puffed up. Is because I'm bold enough to say the truth. And that's interpreted a lot of times. It's misinterpreted as from people who are not humble to God and they're wanting to be nice to all men and, and have this mushy presentation to men. People like that will interpret boldness to men. They'll interpret that as haughty or conceited. The older you get and the longer you live, and the more you study the Word, the more humble to God you'll be, and people will call you all kinds of names for that. It's all right. Huh? That's okay. They did Jesus' That's right. They were after Paul. 
They weren't just after Paul at Corinth. They were after him at Rome. They were after him at Galatia. They were after him at Colossia. They were after him at Ephesus. They tried to kill him at Ephesus several times. They drove him into the Colosseum, and he said, Alexander, one of the preachers at the church over there, was with the people while they were wanting to kill me. He said, Beware of Alexander. Now, swellings, tumults. These people are full of akatastasia, a.k.a. T.A. This is tumults. Katastasia would be stable, placing the alpha in front of the word as a negative particle, the alpha primitive negates the word, and akatastase means unstable. These people who are striving, erotheia, full of intrigue, they're secretly, over, underhandedly, trying to trick and perplex, this is going on in the church. I've had more of this go on in the church from young preachers than anything else. I've had so many young preachers come in here. You think I ought to go preach? I've told you all the story. A little young guy about 23 came in here one night. We stood outside. This is back 10 years ago, I guess. He's smoking a cigarette. He said, I think God wants me to go preach. What do you think? I said, no. <laughs> I said, you don't know anything about the Bible. You're standing there with a cigarette in your hand. I think God wants me to preach. What do you think? No. Go home. Learn something. Get rid of that cigarette. How foolish. Don't, if you're 23, don't ask me if, if I think you ought to preach. You've already got the answer. It takes a lot, a lot to learn how to deal with people. You know how I deal with them? Leave them alone in their era, and God will deal with them in time. Now, Erethea. How much time do I have, Mike? No. Ben? 16. Boy, I'm not getting through this. Uh, I want us to go over here to James, the third chapter. I'm not getting... This thing on Erethea needs a lot of teaching. Because I believe this goes on in the church as much as anything that goes on in the church. Chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters. You don't need a lot of teachers. He's telling the church, don't... So I need to listen to this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. I have people call me and say, I listen to you and I listen to this other guy and I listen to the other guy. And I'm confused about things. I guess you are. Listen to some guy that's free will. Listen to another guy that's a charismatic. Listen to another guy that's Pentecostal and listen to me. You're going to be confused because I'm going to call those other guys the liars that they are. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, get a hold of your tongue. He's talking about bridling the tongue over there in the first chapter. He's talking about, look in verse 25 of the first chapter. Whoso looketh into the perfect, the teleos, complete, Full age. The perfect mature. Full age. Grown up. Something that is mature. Whoso, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. We're at liberty because we've been forgiven of sin. Forgive means to pardon and release from prison. 
You've come out of darkness to light, and you're no longer slaves in the world. This word liberty means a citizen, not a slave. And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. If any man among you seem to be religious, just because somebody looks religious don't mean they are. You're going to have to check them out. And look what he says. And bridleth not his tongue. The word bridleth is the word kaling agago, agoge. C-H-A-L-I-N. Let me erase this. C-H-A-L-I-N. A G O G E. Kalinagoge. If any man bridleth not, curb with a bit, like you put in a horse's mouth. Curb your tongue. If a man he has to curb his tongue, he has to direct his tongue in the right direction. If he bridleth not his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This man's religion is vain. It's not any good. If you run your mouth the way you shouldn't, and then he tells you pure religion. The word religion is the word threskia. It means ritual. There's only one pure ritual. It's not baptizing people in water. It's not crackers and grape juice. Here it is right here. Is to visit pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless. It doesn't mean orphans out here. It is the word orphanos. And it's the same word over in John 14, I will not leave you comfortless. Comfortless. I will send the comforter, the parakletos, P-A-R-A-K-L-E-T-O-S. And then he says, that is the Holy Spirit. So when we are comfortless, that's when we are orphans spiritually so if you want a pure ritual is, is that to visit the church, the fatherless and the widows, the word widow is the word kira, it means one without a husband. That is the church. Pure religion is to visit the church in their affliction. When we, that's what this, to visit the church in their thalipsis, in their tribulation, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Don't run around with the wrong people. Get your tongue bridled. Go back over to the third chapter and look at that verse. If any man offend not in word, the same is a teleos, a perfect man. You got to watch your tongue. Your tongue can be in the form of emails. That's your tongue. You need to watch out what you say on the internet in letters you write. Because if any man offends in word, it's not just something you say with your mouth. It's any communications you have to the world. If you offend people, you're not a mature man. You're a child. You're a carnal person. Do you know that I think this is, I've been a thinker and an evaluator, and I've been analytical ever since I was a boy. I didn't know that's what I was doing. Whenever I say something, I think about everything I say. If I talk to one of you, I have motives behind what I'm saying. I don't talk just to run my mouth. Sometimes I'll be telling one of you about somebody's 
at the church here how they've come out of trouble and how they've begin to grow and how that they begin to get stronger. Anytime I say something about somebody, it's in that fashion. I don't gossip about people. I've been accused of that, and that's just not true. I've never gossiped about people. If I have something to say, if I hear something that sounds like gossip, I'll say, whoa, we need to stop this because it sounds like gossip. I do that more than anybody I know. We need to curb our tongue. Does that mean cussing? Well, yeah. Does that mean telling dirty stories? Yes. Does that mean gossiping? Yes. Does that mean putting people down and you don't even know what they're about and don't even know what's been said you don't, and you just hear something and you embellish it and you build it up to something it's not? Is that curbing your tongue? No, that ain't curbing your tongue. We have to direct all of our speech to something positive. If I say anything, I've said this about some men here. I say, well, Dave's got a temper. I had a real bad temper. Dave's been overcoming his. Tom had a temper. He's overcoming it. Uh, Fred had a temper. He used to be a biker. Well, what do you expect? Bikers and, and, uh, and guys who've been in heavy metal music to have a temper? Well, I guess so. And I've had a terrible temper. And I usually throw myself in the same basket with other guys that's had the same problem. If I'm talking about somebody, I'm talking about them in a positive sense so I can help you to see how to have compassion on them and how to help bring them out of what they've been in. And I talk about Dave in a real positive way. He's come a million miles. People say, have I? Mary will say, have I, have I grown? I don't think I've seen anybody here that's grown any more than my wife. Did she have a temper? Oh, goodness, I guess. In her 40s and 30s, ask her. She can tell you, can't she? Yeah, but you can tell her. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm afraid most of us have had bad tempers, haven't we? You know why I say that to the congregation? The reason I'll say something like this is so you'll know that you're not alone. You understand that? I want you to know, if you're like, well, i got to hide my temper from Jim because he ain't never been this way. Yes, I have. We all have been, haven't we, Ken? We've all been like that. I want you to know we're all in the same boat. If I tell you about somebody else, I usually tell you something. I throw myself in the same basket with them. So I can say, watch them. Watch how they're progressing and coming out of it. But don't call that gossip. That's not gossip. I'm trying to encourage you to see how to treat people. I've got so much more on this word eruthia here. I want to, I was going to read this chapter again. He talks about the tongue is a member. He said we put bits in the horse's mouth in verse 3 and they obey us and, and we turn about their whole body you can do that with your own tongue. Behold also the ships, with though they be great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm. Just a little helm turns the whole ship in the wind. And are driven with fierce winds. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. I brought this out last week. The word great things, megalokeo, means to talk big. Uh, talking big, embellishing things, and blowing it up to something it's not. We're not supposed to be doing that either. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. You know what the Bible says your tongue is? It's a fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Your tongue is a world of iniquity. Everything I say, you know I'm real aware if I say something that's off base and off kelter. Sometimes I'll say something, well I say I didn't mean that. Let me back up. Maybe some of y'all have heard me say that. Let me back up. I didn't mean that. It means I want to correct myself. The tongue is a little fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body 
and setteth on fire the course of nature, it is set on fire of hell. Your tongue is a hell fire. And it can destroy lives and destroy people. That's one thing I'm not going to do. I have known things on people in this ministry and I'm not going to destroy you. Not going to do it. If I say anything about people, it will be to help them come out. If you get real gentle with people and kind and tender-hearted, you have, you have a lot more influence than if you say, you need to repent right now. Nobody listens to that. There's people here that's had a hard time. I go up and put my around, arm around them when they're struggling. And even when some of them been angry, I put my arm and say, I love you. I love you too. How you doing? Oh, I'm just being ornery right now. I know. I have, and I, you know what I do? If they say, I'm just having a hard time right now, I say, yeah, me too. I have a hard time sometimes. I have a hard time overcoming myself. I know how you feel. We need to be concerned about each other. For every kind of beast and birds and serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil and it's full of deadly poison and it'll destroy. I'm going to come back to this chapter next week and I'm going to go into gossip, slandering, tailbearing. It's one thing I don't do and I don't believe in. I've been accused of that. I have called people down pointedly, but it's usually over sin and I don't get mean when I do it. I asked one guy, I sat down in my kitchen and I said, are you sleeping with so-and-so? He dropped his head and said, yeah, and he started crying. I said, you can't do that and come to grace and truth. You know that. I said it just like that. And he cried. And if he's watching, I hope he is. I hope he'll understand you've got to straighten your life out. You can't live that way. Not in being fellowship here. You can live that way if you want to, and I won't have anything to say about you, but you can't fellowship here and do that. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. And he goes on down and talks about, does a fountain send forth both sweet and water and bitter? It's not to come out of our mouths. I think about everything I say. I usually think ahead about what I'm going to say. I've been accused of, you always think you're right. You always talk and don't listen. When I do talk, it's over thing I've... You know, in life, I, I talk to people the same way I teach from the pulpit. I've thought about what I'm going to say. I think as I'm going along, I don't just... A lot of people just rattle off and say anything that comes to their mind as they, as they can just to have their way. I don't talk to people that way. I think about everything I'm going to say, and that's why I'm accused sometimes of, you do all the talking, you don't do the listening. I'll listen to you, and after I listen to you, listen to what I've got to say to you. Because usually I'm going to make sense, and when you make sense and you're talking to somebody who's unreasonable, they don't want something that makes sense, and so they accuse you of things that's not true. They don't like it when somebody is reasonable and analytical and they make sense and everything has to add up. That's the way I talk to the world. I talk to, when I'm walking into Publix or Kroger's, supermarkets, I'll pray a quick little prayer. Lord, I, maybe I haven't said some things I could say. If there's something I haven't said, put me in somebody's path and help me to be more gentle and more tenderhearted and more kind and more compassionate than I have been because I'm not the same person I was when I was 55. Has anybody noticed that? I'm not the same. If I'm not growing, I can't teach you to grow. I have to be growing. Even Jim Reynolds said, he said, you're not the way you were when I first come here. I said, well, I was angry a lot. I was going through a lot of anger and a lot of, but I'm not like that now. So I'm trying to teach you how you need to live. Get rid of all of this 
Don't stand off with somebody in a faction and in an intrigue with Erethea and you're plotting and you're being scheming secretly and you're underhandedly trying to trick or perplex somebody to have your way and find out some kind of plot so you can, uh, so you can uh, uh, go against the group of people working in a common cause against the main body. Don't do that. We're supposed to be living in this together. Uh, I'm out of time, but I'll read it. What is it? 14? Yeah, if you have bitter envying and strife, Eruthia, glory not and lie not against the truth. A lot of people have lied against the truth here. And they would actually say they were doing truth. I'm going to talk about how you can tell if you're doing truth in this series. There's a difference in saying I'm doing truth and doing truth. There's a, sim there's a difference in saying I'm walking in agape and walking in it. You can talk about it all day long. It don't mean anything. And we're going to go through. This series on Sunday night is more practical to the life of the believer than anything I've taught in a long time. This ain't as exciting as the 70 weeks of Daniel. It's not as exciting as prophecy. But I hope that people get a hold of this, how we're to be living we're predestined to be like Jesus. And he wasn't plotting and scheming, was he? 15 and 16. This wisdom descendeth not from above. When you're full of strife, every thea, it's not from above, and you're going to call it from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish. Sensual is sukikos. Earthly is the word gay. means of the soul. Sukikos, B-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S. That means of the flesh. And devilish is the word daemonion. He wants to distribute fortunes to self. For we're envying zealous, anger and rage, and strife is... Where there is erythea, there is confusion, there is kata, or akatastasia. No, there's instability in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable. If you really have peaceable wisdom, the word peaceable is arenekos. comes from arene, meaning peace. It means just that. It's peaceful. It doesn't fight. It doesn't start fights. It doesn't try to win battles. It's gentle. Epiikos. It's easily approached. Epiikos. Easily entreated. It's compliant. That word easily entreated you pithos it's easily persuaded with the truth full of mercy of good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy there's no hypocrisy no hypocrites no acting involved and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace let's pray Lord thank you for truth Help us in this series to see how Jesus, what Jesus is like so we'll know what we're predestined to. We know you're going to take us through it and teach it to us as we live. Thank you for your word. God, I pray you'll give us strength to continue this ministry for years to come according to your mercy. God, I pray that you'll lead us to your elect family. Help the church to grow, not so much in numbers, Lord, but spiritually to grow and become mature. You will lead us to who you want us to go to. Open up doors for the ministry. We'll praise you for it all in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, I'm, I hope I'm going to try to finish up this Eruthia next week, get into more things that Jesus was not like, and get into the things he was like, because that's what predestined to. Now, you can like this or not, that's the truth.